Welcome back. We're at another episode of the Classics in Conversation. Uh, and this week we're joined by another classic. It's Dara. How are you? How are you doing? Good, thank you. How are you guys doing? Yeah, we are doing okay. Currently existing. Yes. Yes. We ask, um, <laughs> yeah. we ask our guest every week and it's gone from being like, yeah, yeah, to being like, yeah, yeah. we're here. So I have a cat. Therefore, I'm fine. Yes, yes. That is a very good answer. It's a big mood. Like, um, I am glad that I can just smush my face into parsnip when the world feels like it's a bit much. Yeah. I I don't have a cat right now, so (laughs) I use use baby Yoda. I mean, is that not the same thing? He's got very soft ears. Very so. good, pointy ears. <laughs> yeah, very good. <laughs> I'm going to send you like some sea monkeys, like like from Amazon Please or something, do. so you can have a little oh, pet. Have a pet. Love it. So good. Um, so today's classic is an uh, interview with a vampire, um, and I feel like everybody's hyped in this room right now. We finally come to the vampires. I love werewolves, I love ghosts, but there is literally nothing in the world that I love more than vampires. I'm very happy. No, no, it's it's true. I mean, it's definitely one of those very formative kind of genres for me. And yeah. especially oh, when yeah. it comes to sort of horror fiction. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't really get anything that, that tops it, really. No, yeah. no. Um, yeah. I think it's like, I definitely think it was my like gateway like into the horror world. Um they're definitely like a sort of vampires or a gateway drug kind of thing um mm-hmm. and i remember like quite vividly like reading the Anne rice books um yes. like i remember that point like quite well like i think i was on holiday and i remember just being like at the beach like this is a gigantic goth book while i sit in the sun um what what oh yeah yeah right <laughs> oh yeah 13 oh, yeah. year old me knew what life was around like was about mm-hmm. um but yeah it was it was a good time so we'll start with the question we always start with uh what are your opinions on the film do you like it oh do you know what right i <laughs> i actually read the books um mm-hmm. as well and i read all of the vampire chronicle books mm-hmm. um the latter of which tend to go a bit off the deep end, but that's, you know, that's yeah. neither here nor there. <laughs> and even though the film changed, like, certain things that I felt mm-hmm. were more important in the book, you know, like, Lily's relationship with his brother, for example, and then turning yes. that into, like, a wife and child mm-hmm. sort of situation, um, mm-hmm. just push that, like, sort of heteronormativity in there. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. We I will get on really, to that. <laughs> yeah, I do really like the film overall. Mm-hmm. Um some of the casting choices was kind of strange. Mm-hmm. Like Armand, who's a ginger-haired Russian child, is now Antonio Banderas, who I will <laughs> yeah. never have a problem with in my entire life. No. Um, but just, yeah, just overall, like, as a film, you know, it was mid-1994, mm-hmm. and a lot of the kind of subtext of that film is stuff that wasn't really talked about, I don't think. So overall, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I think it did really, really well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Gee. <laughs> I mean, as as something else that was made in 1994, it looks better than me for the same age, I reckon. Oh my god, I, <laughs> I feel and, old. No, I, this film is one of my mom's favourite ever films, so I watched it at quite a young age, and she she's also, like, massively obsessed with vampires, so it makes complete sense she's that I am. Such a babe. Oh my god. She's, she's asked for a special mention in this episode, so we'll get on to it, don't worry, mom. Yeah. Um, it's just one of those films. Like, <laughs> it's literally, like you said, Dara, like it is a formative film when you're mm-hmm. watching this kind of mm-hmm. genre. The Anne Rice books and the um the, the film itself. We'll get on to Queen of the Dam. That was formative for many reasons. Oh yeah. um, and I think it is just one of those films. It's an absolute classic of kind of vampire cinema. Mm-hmm. And I love it for that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like when you think about sort of where the, I mean, the book anyway, initially how that sort of came out and what came before that with like the stand and a lot of these novels that were focusing more on vampire hunters, mm-hmm. um, having having this book come out that was focusing on the actual vampires themselves was quite 
a new thing, I think, at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, now we've got tons of media that's, that does that. But, I, I mean, Anne Rice really is kind of the, the OG of, of that yeah. kind of situation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely 100%. agree. Um, I think that's a really interesting way of putting it because they sort of had everybody talking about them but not really them talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's a really interesting point. You get to see the film from like an entirely different point of view. Um, And it's it's a much closer point of view as well. Like there's no sort of like narrator to kind of hide behind. Like you're you're right there with these guys. Um, And I think that's a really good point. Like Anne Rice is definitely like the mom of a lot of the vampire films that we've got now. which sort of leads me leads me nicely on um, to the cultural impact that we think this film has had. And I think it's had a <sighs> huge one. Mm-hmm. I think this has probably had the most prolific out of a lot of the things we've talked about so far this series. Like, I know we always say, like, Psycho has the knife and Jaws has the, the music, but I feel like this is the whole, the whole of a subgenre of film. Yeah, I mean, like, as far as cu- cultural impact goes, God, I mean, okay, well, first of all, they have the cast. Mm-hmm. Um, so, obviously, Tom right. Cruise, Brad Pitt, and Kirsten Dunst, incredibly prolific actors, mm-hmm. in, you know, that have lasted mm-hmm. from then until now. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the, the score of the film itself is also, like, really, you know, you, yeah. you know it exactly whenever you hear it. Um, but I think... It, it's really, you know, as you kind of like said previously, it's kind of shaped a lot of the narrative that we see now mm-hmm. about vampires in, in general um, and the kind of novels that have come out and this the kind of like the emotional vampire. Mm. Oh my um, God, yeah. The, Such a good way that, of putting it, yeah. Yeah, like the one that kind of like feels guilt for mm-hmm. for kind of being this creature that needs to feed on humans and mm-hmm. um so i think we've seen a lot more exploration of that i think in in kind of more modern books and things that have come out in like the last you know 20 years mm-hmm. yeah almost 30 years georgie <laughs> go on i can see that you're like bursting at the seams go on <laughs> it's is the running joke whenever the thing goes around. It's like if you could, if you had to just be told you've got to deliver a TED talk in five minutes, it lasts for an hour. What is it on? And mine's always, I always say the cultural and sociological impact of the Twilight series. Yeah. And that would be I completely mean, impossible. <laughs> you know yeah. me too well. That would be completely impossible without Anne Rice. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And you you absolutely nailed it. It's the emotional, broody, sexy camp floppy haired vampire mm-hmm. it's just, do you know what i mean it's not like the <laughs> yeah i mean there is the description you know. like in in the books um very much so about uh how they have this kind of almost insectile shimmer about them that mm. like brings prey to them and i think i think um stephanie Myers definitely tried to tap into that with her kind of glittering vampire cullen tried thing. yeah i mean i've got <laughs> my own feelings about twilight i was never a twilight um, it was fine I but, <laughs> but um i do you know it is 100 percent accurate that those books mm-hmm. would not exist without that rice yeah 100 yeah, percent, and it's one of those things in terms of how vampires were represented you've got i mean the kind of the way ra- vampires are represented in popular culture is a minefield for so much kind of discrimination against minorities and stuff it's really really interesting mm-hmm. but um when you've got this emotional vampire, I love that. That is so exactly what it is. Also, I've, I must admit, I've latched onto the idea of like the guilty monster as well. I'm like, ooh, ooh, what a concept. Give me like a broody, a broody baby. And I'm like, ah, oh, yes. And that's it. Like, it's that kind of genre that isn't the the Dracula, that isn't like the Salem's lot, isn't mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. kind of properly really Nosferatu looking vampire. Yeah, the bestial vampire. Yeah, flipped the switch and just made them soft, beautiful babies. It's so like, oh wait. Fun. I think it's like, I think it's super interesting, you know, as you kind of like said, with the um, the kind of thing with the vampires and like treatment of minorities and things like that, um, mm-hmm. especially because vampires as metaphor for, you know, aristotic, mm-hmm. aristocratic blood suckers is, yeah. is very much a thing. Love that, um, yeah. And also when you consider the term like emotional vampire for mm-hmm. people who mm-hmm. you know just come to you with all of their problems and then take all of your 
occur and then just leave you high and dry. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's like there's a lot of different layers that you can peel back on this oh, kind yeah. of onion that is vampires. Oh, Absolutely, I love the idea of like like that. There, there's a lot. I think there's a lot of people at the minute. Like I've seen it come up really recently. Um, lots of people talking about that sort of metaphor for different classes and races and social standing mm-hmm. and all sorts of stuff in the whole sort of concept of vampires and werewolves um and I find that whole thing absolutely fascinating <clears throat> and I think it really does ring true like you guys have said um there's such a distinct like difference between the sort of wealthy snazzy vampire and then like the bestial kind of like animal vampire mm. um because I think even like even in Twilight, like I know we're going to probably like compare the two quite regularly. Um, <laughs> they're well off, like they're just yep. unquestioned well off. No one, no one wonders where all this money comes from. And there's this concept of like, you know, Louis obviously has you know quite a big sort of. Um, he's a plantation owner at the yeah. beginning, and and they have this concept of old money. And like mm. the only other people I know with old money are never that great. Let's be real. Okay. Like, um, and I think that's really interesting. It's a really interesting parallel. And the side note to all of this, and this is questions going to sound bananas, is what was Fifty Shades of Grey based off? Is that Twilight? Don't, don't. yeah, yeah. Which it means was. that Anne Rice realistically is responsible for the creation of Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, to be fair, there was some Fifty Shades of Grey shit that went on in the. Uh, vampire chronicles <laughs> oh yeah to be fair Aye. yeah she i'm not she'll be like oh my legacy has finally happened <laughs> oh my yeah, goodness yeah. so grim anyway that's something um, i'm not gonna have to think about for a while <laughs> i was literally as we were talking about it and you're saying like that you know obviously like that shimmering um whatever the skin of like... a killer bella let's <laughs> see I'm so sorry. Spider, it's going to be like this spider all monkey. Um, so, you know, they have that sort of like correlation. All I could think about was like, well, hang on, doesn't that fit in with that as well? So um, <laughs> it's always a black sheep in the family. Um, right. So we talked about it a little bit um, when we talked about the subtexts, super little bit. I'm going to talk about it more now. Um, homoeroticism to the max <laughs> like what me and Dara talked about this very briefly uh, a little bit earlier today when, um, in the in the Twitter chats because um, I watched this this morning as a little rewatch and then I watched like a Hannibal so I was like what a morning I have had it's been That's a like, good morning it's been emotions all over the show lots of piney boys um, but my gosh this is full of it to the eyeballs like looking at it it's so heavy within the first like 20 minutes they're like I was like do you guys need a minute like my lord yeah one of the things I actually think is really interestingly done in in the film and in the book but um in the context of the film Mm. is how they kind of take the concept of a nuclear family and just completely subvert that Mm -hmm. with um, the addition of of obviously Kirsten Dunst's Claudia, yeah. Um, and instead of having this, you know, picture perfect father mother daughter kind of situation, mm-hmm. you have father father's kind of husband who gifted you to him, and mm-hmm. also daughter question mark yeah. kind of thing, but also walking around as this kind of like new money sort of situation, mm-hmm. um, because that's what essentially what Sats parading around as, yeah, um, and all very well dressed, all very, you know, body with her coiffed hair and, and yeah, so it's just her curls are like the craziest thing. Like <sighs> just and it's yeah. it's just it's incredible to me because you know, there's so many instances of like the child going to sleep with their in their parents' bed whenever they get scared and you know how Claudia would creep mm-hmm. into Lou's coffin. Yeah. Um and how that kind of then obviously becomes tainted as she matures mm-hmm. and she becomes angry. Mm. Yeah, I definitely think like um like Kirsten Dunst was like amazing considering she yeah. was probably mm-hmm. what like 12, 12 ish? Yeah, oh, she was God. super tiny, I think. Um, I don't remember how old she was. Yeah, and like 
I think it's a really amazing character as well because she is just like eternally trapped as this doll. Like it's not even sort of like an age where you could do anything else. You're li- she's a little tiny um, like doll little girl like with the ringlets and what they dress her in especially. Like um, she's never like low key. She's always like decked to the nines with like the fanciest yeah. hat or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um but like I, I find it really interesting to see how, as she, you know, ages inside, obviously not outside, um, that her sort of like frustration and the fact that she's obviously like maturing into a woman and she knows that she'll never be one and she sees it with that um, woman that she that she kills and keeps in her bed, um, and it turns into this like murderous rage. Yeah. Um. And I always think that's she's to for me. She's like the best one of the whole film. Like, um, I have real issue with the casting and the like all all of this film, apart from Claudia. Like, I think that she's absolutely spot on. And like, I think um, that portrayal of rage as well is just perfect. Why do you have issues with? Should why it? do you have issues with the casting? I'm so excited. I'm so intrigued. Because it's stupid. <laughs> Okay, I have an issue with the casting because Tom Cruise is just a tiny little mania man and just inherently not right. I know that he has like a degree of like narcissism, but he doesn't have the right degree of narcissism mm. for Lestat to play. Like right at the end when he's driving off on the Golden Gate Bridge and mm. he's like all smog and he's dead proud of himself and he's just chewed up. Um, David. Uh, yeah. And he's like laughing, right? It's just manic Tom Cruise on the couch yelling about Kate Holmes. It isn't like Lestat, like, ha 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 ha. No, hate it. Sorry. Uh-oh. Is it because you love Stuart Townsend, though? It is. Yeah, exactly. I do love Stuart Townsend. However, it is not for that. It's still because he's a just bad choice. I, I actually like I Tom Cruise as Lestat. But... <laughs> I know what I know. I'm with I, you. I, yeah, go for it. I, I love to hear it. Like I said to G before, I watched it again today, and there was just so many bits where I was like, now looking at it, having matured. Well, I hope I matured since I was 13. Like it doesn't really work for me on a few levels, but I also mm. haven't read the book for nearly 20 years. That's so fair. that may be a key difference. But tell me, tell me the good things. You might change my mind. You won't, but you <laughs> might change my mind. And well, for me personally, anyway, I felt that in in that particular role, God, I'm just saying the Queen in the Dam now. Yeah, but, oh. <laughs> it's a screensaver uh, of my mind, Queen yeah. of the Dam. To be fair, <laughs> but um, yeah, whenever I, genuinely, whenever I think about Tom Cruise in that particular role with the with the blonde hair mm-hmm. and the sort of really bright eyes. And the smarminess that he mm. brings to it, and the theatricality of like yeah. when he flips open the coffin with the woman <laughs> yeah. and stuff and looks so yeah. horrifying, and just how like because we all list that as it's so he's a dramatic mm-hmm. little like oh my Rich. goodness like yeah. he is anything if not essentially a stage mum yeah and yes the totally 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 yeah. yes. And seeing Tom Cruise just kind of like prance around as Lisa, mm-hmm. I'm just like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> um, of anyone, actually, Brad Pitt as Louis kind of raises my eyebrows. Like, I love mm-hmm. that film and I won't, like, I don't, I can't see it as anyone else because, you mm-hmm. know, I've yeah. watched it 100%. as those people for my entire yeah. life. And I'm just like, I don't, in my brain, whenever I think of that film, I can't think of anyone else in those mm-hmm. roles. But Brad Pitt, I don't know, he could, I, he's maybe too. Like, he's got such a sort of... Big square this, head. <laughs> square head. Um, I was going to say, like, he's, he's, his jaw is so, like, strong, right? Mm, yeah. I always picture Lee, whenever I read the book, you know, you have the sort of mental mm, images. Yeah. I, I always picture Lee as being this kind of, like, really skinny, like, pointy dude, just, like, kind of quite... Um, like Timothy Chalamet kind of skinny, yeah, pointy, like angular boy. Yeah, exactly. Like and just really like timid and stuff. Whereas Brad mm-hmm. Pitt, I I don't know if it's just like his just general you know personality coming through, but he's he is like you know he has a presence. Whereas I think mm-hmm. Louis, for like at least the majority of the story, he's obviously you know at the end he he kind of like mm-hmm. makes his presence very known. Um, <laughs> very known. But he you know I I always felt like 
you know, Lou's trying to make himself small in mm. comparison to Lestat for the majority of this this story. Um, and Brad Pitt, he does a lot of crying, obviously, but he <laughs> he doesn't really, you know, he doesn't have the same kind of like mousiness about him. Yeah. Um, but that's that's all I really would have to say about Brad Pitt. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. Like, I definitely felt like his his whole portrayal was like a bit more just sort of like really bland and like I didn't feel like he was obviously you can see he looks sad and he looks unhappy about the situation that he's in but I think like you say he's got too much of a presence Mm -hmm. and because he was quite at the beginning of his career but I feel like you can kind of see it with people who are going to have like a strong career Mm -hmm. like we did um We've done a couple of films with that were um, actors for sort of debut films, and I think you could see it in them that they were going to mm-hmm. go on and, and do a lot of things. And <clears throat> I think, like you say, he did have too much of a presence, and he didn't sort of seem remorseful. He just almost seemed like he was aimlessly wandering and just being like, "Oh, yeah. I'll go over here and I'll do that. I'll burn my house down and <laughs> sort of just, just burn my house down. Yeah, just totter <laughs> around and." I was a bit like, mm, have do something, right? Yeah, and he spent he spent an awful lot of time just kind of like, because you know from the book I always kind of got this impression was that's basically you know he's got him over a barrel essentially. Mm. Yeah, um, sure. He's not telling him essentially like how to do vampire things by yeah. himself. He's very much keeping yeah. him there, um, because he's he's telling Lou that like oh like. I'm the only one that can turn people into vampires. I'm the only yeah. one that can like yeah. keep you alive. I'm the only one that can teach you. So he's kind mm-hmm. of stuck with him. So you know, it's which is like so horrific and manipulative and and abusive, mm-hmm. um, which you know we we ought to touch on as well. Mm. Because that is a horrible part. Yeah, I hadn't oh noticed God. until like <laughs> this this watch um, mm-hmm. and like more recent watches how horrendous he is in terms of like gaslighting and and all sorts of stuff because he does say to him like oh we'll just read their minds and he's like well like, well, I can't and he's like oh well powers are different but you know I'll, I'll tell you what to say and I'll help you we'll go and find these people together mm-hmm. and you know you can't do this but I've brought you this child that you lost and I was like stop it stop being such mm-hmm. a prick leave him and alone the whole, the whole thing with with you know bringing him to Claudia is mm-hmm. like it's just another thing for Lestat in order to like ex- exercise that control yeah. over him, which Definitely. obviously you know bites him in the back in the end. Mm-hmm. Um, but and, and as a kid, like <laughs> I really loved Lestat. Like I was like, mm-hmm. I want to be him. He's so cool. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah. but you know he's a terrible person. Horrible. And he, he's awful. consistently terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> even in even in his own book, you know, like the Vampire mm-hmm. Lestat, he's awful he's a terrible person Mm -hmm. yeah he is a really funny character to like follow around because he is really not that great (laughs) like he has very few redeeming qualities like all in all you'd be like oh shit great like of all the people all the vampires to find i always find like um you know armand's was was probably when I got through the whole like series of books, he was probably my favorite of, mm. of the main kind of mm. vampires because he, you know, he obviously went through a lot of stuff, but in the context of like when he is in interview with the vampire and he's, you know, at the circus mm. and he's, you know, showing that he is like, he's older than Lestat and he's older than Louis mm. and he is leading this troop of vampires um, that have this like very strange belief system in, mm. in themselves, which is you know part of what brings them to this kind of um, like conflict with mm. Lestat and Louis and Claudia, mm. um, and he's he's kind of this really interesting and stoic character almost mm. at the beginning, and you don't really know very much about him, and you get this sense that there's this, like a lot of sort of layers and mystery behind the, uh, his particular character in Interview with the Vampire. And obviously mm-hmm. you'll need to find out about you know, stuff like that much later on in the series. But mm-hmm. um, it's one of those kind of like presence things again that I kind of like, I kind of see him and Lestat as kind of two sides of the same coin almost. Mm-hmm. Because 
they're both incredibly Vian. Yeah. But Armand learns to work with people, mm. whereas Lestat tends to use his parts to like manipulate people into doing what he wants. Yeah. Which then obviously you can see in how they both approach Louis at the end. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Definitely. Everybody loves Louis. Like they should just rename it to literally just everybody loves Louis. Like everyone loves Louis. What is it about that boy? Because like his hairdo is terrible. Yeah. Uh, there's a bit oh, at the end where he's got like his big hair and he's like fluffy coat. <laughs> and I'm like, are you the beast from Beauty and the Beast? Mm. I th the thing about Louis is like maybe they're attracted to all of the salt. I don't maybe. Know. It's the brooding. <laughs> he was like the broodiest. So they were like, oh my God. Yeah, He's been very... sad for 57 years. It's a whole 57 years. It's, <laughs> yeah, the bit when, it's the bit when he's talking to Claudia and he's like, oh yeah, like, you can eat rats. And Claudia's mm. like, you used to eat rats? And he's <laughs> <Yeah>. like, ugh. <laughs> yeah. 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 For sure. Uh, funny. <laughs> what about you, Dee? What do you think of the eroticism? <laughs> Well, I think <laughs> for a very, very, very long time, vampires have been used as a tool to talk about the difficult parts of humanity and the parts of humanity that people didn't want to talk about and wanted to condemn. Mm -hmm. And when they use as this vessel for um, homosexuality with the emphasis on sexuality because i mean god vampires are the sexiest things ever everything <laughs> about them is sexual it, it's like academically speaking yeah, even like not the, personally speaking not personally speaking academically <laughs> speaking i'll link the papers not just like my fan fiction um like everything even the act of like biting and like yeah. breaking skin and that kind of like mm -hmm. not a good enough reason to use the word it's not penetration yeah but it, it's an incredibly sexual creature mm -hmm. And when that's kind of amped up and moved to the concept of homosexuality at its inception, when you have in the 1800s things like Dracula, mm -hmm. what I think is super interesting, especially with vampires, is the other participant at some point in a mm -hmm. lot of instances tends to be willing. You see it in Dracula a lot, how mm -hmm. the women are like scared and then they're like, actually <laughs> and then they kind of give themselves which i think is mm -hmm. really really interesting so when it's used in the concept of homosexuality as that kind of commentary from the 1800s and how it's moved to now mm -hmm. i think it's really interesting to track the cultural impact and how it's changed from a condemnation to almost kind of i <laughs> in 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 good cases it's an exploration in bad cases it's a fetishization because there's definitely different ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I think what we said before about how there were changes between the book and the film in terms of how relationships were portrayed with other men versus mm. just putting a woman in. You know, I think that's a really interesting switcheroo that got mm. kind of played in that sense. Yeah. I think it's very interesting that they changed it from his brother to his wife and child because yeah. they kind of like allowed for that nuclear family that they made this is it and i think a lot of what that was was to kind of stem the i mean i don't know it could be i could be completely misreading it but for me it feels like there's a lot of chemistry between those two especially mm -hmm. on screen and i feel like it might have just been like oh no wife and kids wife and kids wife and kids yeah there's like mixtures of things isn't there because like I, I was sort of reading a few different articles today and one of them was like to Neil Jordan, the director, was mm -hmm. it was in a later interview after it had been out for a while. And it was, you know, do you did you feel at any point that you were told to stamp down this homoeroticism? And he said no. He said, you know, I took a lot from the book and I took a lot of and I wanted it to be truthful and I wanted it to be faithful to the book. And then there's other reports that say that Tom Cruise was like chill with this like stop doing that and I'd rather have it a little bit more this way and so I guess you don't really know like the actual vibe on set I guess and like yeah, what, the, sure. what the people's thoughts and stuff were around it but the finishing result is everybody loves Louis it's true mm -hmm. it's also it's quite interesting how you kind of like whenever you really you know vampirism to homosexuality and sort of you know Dracula and things like that mm -hmm. um 
I think the book was written in the 70s, if I yeah, remember 70, correctly. 76, this, this one. 76. Yeah. So if you consider that kind of homoeroticism and then also consider when the book was written and the mm-hmm. AIDS crisis at the time, and you consider Absolutely. that kind of vampirism mm-hmm. through the blood, you know, um, sharing fluids and so on and so forth, mm. and then this kind of almost infection kind of scenario, I yes. think that's quite poignant especially mm. whenever you come through that in this kind of like um accelerated process of change mm. and become othered by your society mm-hmm. um i think there's an awful lot you can unpack there around stigma yes and it Definitely. goes all the way back all yeah. the way back so in the late 1800s the concept of degeneration was really really widely mm. spoken about and how humans might not evolve forwards you might evolve backwards and exactly like you say vampirism the contagion element was seen as something that was really really scary to people this kind mm-hmm. of otherness this kind of um perverse kind of thing that you could catch was a real real anxiety for people mm. and seeing how it tracks into like you said mid 70s peak of kind of the AIDS crisis and it just there's no no such thing as an original idea, is there? It's it's mm. all kind of the same anxieties and the same thoughts being recycled over and over, and um, mm-hmm. it's really interesting to see how that tracks forward. I think. Yeah, because um, with Bram Stoker, you know, like one of one of his big sort of influences were things like typhus mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. cholera and and those kinds of illness. Um, and then obviously, you know, Dracula as bad blood in in mm. Irish, and it's just. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's why he often comes out of clouds of like water and fog because that's how they believed mm-hmm. all of those things were, were transmitted. Mm. Yeah, it's like the miasma theories. It's, yeah, oh absolutely. God, I love it. <laughs> it's so, it's, let's say it's so fast, it's so much to look at and it's so much to unpack with it. And when you go to like different cultures and read different, different vampire myths that aren't like super Eurocentric, it's really interesting to see how they can all tie in too. But mm-hmm. I could talk about it forever for sure. <laughs> love it i love it man i'm like yes i agree <laughs> vampires <Yes. Woo-hoo>. um <laughs> love it man love that shit um i love like looking at you know you have this concept of this creature and then the fear is just like 70 layers deep um mm-hmm. like you said you know it is an onion they are the onions of the monster world Not garlic, speaking of onions. which you know which um this does really tangibly link together but i said to georgie before um the antonio banderas is um armand kind of reminds me of his piss in boots in the shrek series yeah um i don't know why it's just because he's all like and i'm like but then he's always boots. gonna be zorro he, he's oh, always gonna be zorro I love that that's fair love that and anthony hopkins is in that and i love him we do oh, we know. sweet baby we know. um so well one of my questions was why do we think the vampires are the sexiest of all the creatures how long have you got (laughs) well Um, in this literally right yeah i love this i love how like we're we're starting off so much um okay you can give me three words okay that's not one of my words (laughs) (laughs) i can give you a couple minutes if you'd like a couple minutes okay the female gears Ooh, love it I'm not going to bother that. because nothing's going to compete with that because that is literally perfect and has <laughs> every single reason. It's mm. all about the eyes and the hands and the lips. Mm-hmm. It's all it's about the them and they're, and they're always clean. They're clean. They're well read. They're well educated. They're groomed. They have nice Sometimes voices. Questionable yeah. hairdos. They don't well, tend yes. to come at you out of nowhere. There's a bit yeah, of get... that goes on first. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there's a lot of wooing as well. They are quite often quite, um, and when it's men, they're quite gentlemanly. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's also, of course, the lady vampires that we're not really mentioning, but they're saucy. Like, vamp- mm, you know, Dracula's brides, saucy ladies. It's it's true. It is true. But I also think there's, um... <sighs> okay, so this this is me going like some, some deep jump Let's here. Let's do it. I'm so but, excited. Um, 
there tends to be an idea, like a kind of social idea that women tend to be more attracted to things that can consume. It's like why we like dinosaurs. It's why we like things with teeth. And it mm-hmm. comes down to like uh, some this kind of concept called vagina dentata mm-hmm. um, and mm-hmm. things surrounding that kind of idea. And it's not too difficult to kind of link one to vampirism because if you consider you know with vampirism with the homoeroticism with the mm-hmm. kind of effeminate men quote unquote um it's it's very very easy to link this kind of like you know monstrous feminine concept mm-hmm. which is to an amazing concept, book by the way have you yes. read yeah <laughs> to to the concept of um teeth to the, mm-hmm. the concept of mm-hmm. consuming another yeah um and when women you know historically have not had a lot of uh power in their lives when they're generally you know um spoken down to when you're trying to take up a certain amount of space then Mm -hmm. you then you get this creature that comes along and basically says like i am offering you power and i'm offering you eternal life and i'm offering Mm -hmm. you eternal um like x y and z and you will have this means to take up your space and take you know revenge on all those who've hurt you it seems like a pretty good deal yeah i think it's safe to say that if someone came up to us we'd be like okay we will take that thank you yes yeah. i mean that's super eloquent i was gonna be like they brush their hair that's, that's yeah. how bo- how low the bar is yes. i think yeah but um yeah we mentioned it then super briefly but monstrous feminine is an incredible book um Mm. i actually read it literally i think it was what two months ago um Mm. and it's got some really really brilliant um points in it and loads of really interesting things about where like women and the concept of being consumed by women um has had a place in history for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years all the way back to like medusa and medusa's iconography and all sorts of stuff Mm. and it is fascinating so i'll put a link in the um show texty box thingamajig because it's fascinating it's and i just i think it's something that's really really cool because um when you think about the vampire right you what you see there is not something that is inherently like a male par symbol they're mm-hmm. generally quite whiffish and sort mm-hmm. of skinny and like you know well dressed as, as you were saying and, and you know well kind of groomed and all that mm-hmm. whereas when you look at like something that would be a male power symbol you get like a kind of a wolverine kind of yeah. thing going on you it's yeah. the the dude that's like completely ripped he's like screaming he's got his shirt off yeah none of that is attractive that's kind of horrifying yeah it's that's like frightening to look at you don't want mm. to feel like this this um symbol of your supposed attraction is going to murder you Mm, even though obviously that's what vampires are going to do Mm -hmm. but they're like the venus fly traps of the monster yes Yes, they are so they have to be attractive Mm. not to bring it down a notch but i have to because you started talking about my old as well if you look at team edward and team jacob girls they're very no but i'm just saying it's really telling because like you said it's a very different sociological concept of the yes. female gaze versus what men think the female gaze is yeah mm-hmm. so in terms of the socialization of men that are i was gonna say non-threatening but they literally are monsters but it's that kind of again quote unquote effeminate man mm-hmm. the da- you you said it have earlier dandyish you know <laughs> yeah. my first note about interview with the vampire is lestat is such a little dandy boy yeah like, and like <laughs> he is and they're they're sparkly they mm-hmm. sparkle well, they can't go in the sun and they're well read versus sparkling a fella who cuts about with his top off who is scary who roars who is frightening who is bulky and it, it's just mm-hmm. i think it's a fascinating yeah and then there's also the pack mentality as well i think that you get with that with the vampire with the werewolf, sorry. werewolf yeah um i think it's interesting as well because um i've actually completely forgotten my point so yeah move on <laughs> I was going to say something when you were saying about Team Edward and Team Jacob and I was like... I think a a kind of a really good visual representation of this kind of concept is, and I use this example all the time, but it's Hugh Jackman, right? Mm. So you see Mm -hmm. Hugh Jackman's Wolverine on the cover of that Men's Health magazine and he's like fully... Oh yes, I know what you're going to say. Screaming. And then there's the good housekeeping cover yes. where he's wearing the little blue jumper and he's yes. got a cake and I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes. It, and it's yeah. that's, that's mm-hmm. the difference. Mm-hmm. He's perfect. Greatest for that. showman versus Logan. Let yeah. man sing. He just wants to sing and dance. The best Stop thing him- <laughs> that has ever happened 
Making to the stream. world of cinema <laughs> was when he hosted the Oscars in 2009. I want to say, yeah, when there was when there was um, the recession had hit and there was the right strikes and they basically had no budget. So he made yes. the whole opening show and sang all the way through it. Best opening to the Oscars there has ever been. Mm. I love you, Jackman. We love you, you Jackman. We love you. If you're listening, which you probably are, um, we do love you. Um, you could be a nice vampire boy. Yes. Yeah. As long as he keeps his shirt on and looks cute. Nice yeah, little, right. Nice little plaid shirt. A little yeah. musical number. It's lovely. Um, we should move on. Um, <laughs> Hugh Jackman, what a babe. Um, so... Um, that was what was I going to talk about? Um, yeah, they're really broody. Um, <laughs> I definitely felt like it was like at the beginning, it's like a body movie, um, but like a really depressed broody body movie where like one of them's just like, "Come on, let's go to a party," and the other one's like, "Oh, life is so hard." And I, me and you, basically, yeah, <laughs> we much. go anywhere, pretty much. Um, but also, I love the setting. So I love the um the setting of New Orleans. I think that's like the perfect setting for this particular story or the, uh, the first two thirds of this particular story and then the end. Um, because I think it's got that sort mm. of sense of of like the beauty on top, but maybe like something's going on in the shadows. Especially like, you know, as you were kind of saying before with the money situation, um, you've got Lestat, who I believe comes from like he's this kind of like old gentry from France initially. He is, um, yes. Who winds up in in New Orleans, and they've got Lou, who's this kind of like new up and coming kind of mm-hmm. um, oh, plantation. That's yes. the word, man. And you and you have New Orleans, which is this in in that particular time, this sort of tension between the old mm-hmm. and the new, and also mm-hmm. of course the the tension between the the racial issues, you know, mm-hmm. where Louis is literally keeping slaves. Yes. Like he yeah. literally keeps slaves. Yeah. Um, and then you get that kind of throwback to the Aristotle eh, God, I can't speak today. <laughs> <laughs> aristocratic vampire yes. when Lestat yeah. turns him because he is literally sucking mm-hmm. the blood out of the slaves before he even yes. becomes vampire. Yeah. And he is quite like you can almost sort of see Louis and people like Louis in that position as like the royalty of New Orleans at that point. Yeah, like they have the money, so. they have the land, they have the power, they have literal slaves. You know, they have the run of whatever they want. Um, and I think it goes back to what you're saying as well about um, fears of of things like the plague, um, because there's like scenes where they're, you know, obviously the the burning of the birds that he's fed on and and all the bodies sort of in the river and things like that. Mm. And they're really like intense sequences. Um and they're sort of referring to him as the devil and you know and and yeah. they're all afraid of Lestat and things like that. And I do think you're right. Like there's all the way along that beginning, you know, it's it's not just this fear of this unknown creature. It's everything else that's happening in society as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. That speaks to I think what Dara was saying about um that kind of romanticism on the face of it, because it is one of those it's places it's just like vampires, it's that kind of really beautiful romantic aesthetic. And then there's a real big tension mm. with kind of what lies beneath that. And I think um it's a it's a perfect location for it. Yeah. And there's all there's much symbolism that can be read into um the use of New Orleans, I think for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would definitely like to go. I would love to go to yeah. New Orleans. Yeah. Well, architecture is just beautiful. Love it. Love that. Yeah, it's like it's definitely one of those places that seems to be holding on to that kind of aesthetic from from when it sort of first got built up like that. Yeah. 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 I see it sort of feels like a place that like is kinda like no other. Even if you yeah. like lived in the States, it would be like not just like visiting another place. <laughs> Are yeah. you okay? Is there a vampire? Sorry, I, I, I just kicked something under my desk. It was not a vampire, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Ridiculous. The stuff um, just pops up. It's like, hello. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I feel like we should talk about it because we've mentioned it a bit. But Queen of the Damned. There it is. There it is. <laughs> 
Right. So oh. um, everybody knows that my choice in film is obviously God tier, but no one else quite realizes it yet. Um, so Queen of the Damned is one of my all time faves. Um, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> like, I, I have had years of it being on the shit list. Like, I'm okay with that. Like, I don't mind. Um, but what you were saying about formative years, this for me hit at a real formative point. So, oh. like, that soundtrack was on my CD Walkman every day when I went to high school. And one, like, I did, I listened to it recently. I'm not ashamed to admit. Uh, one of the one of the songs is choice lyrics. I was like, ooh, ooh, maybe take this down, YouTube. I'm not sure these lyrics are great. Um, anyway, definitely not suitable for. Well, I suppose I was 15, but still not that suitable. Um, but I loved it. And I know it was terrible, but I do love Stuart Townsend as snarky, spoiled, little, narcissistic Lestat. Leather-clad. Leather-clad. Yes, yes yeah. okay, yes, and his leather trousers, yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I can appreciate that they tra- what they tried to do. Um, I can appreciate that at the time Lestat was supposed to be, like, a rocker. Mm-hmm. Um, which is which is really cool. Concept in itself, I was like, <laughs> mind blown. I think I uh, literally just moved into like getting into like way more modern music mm-hmm. instead of just like growing up listening to Fleetwood Mac. Do you know the bit that really bothers me? And it's such a such a tiny tiny um, thing which... in that film. What is happening with this hair? Yeah. Why isn't he blonde? I don't yeah. understand. He's supposed to be blonde. He's yeah. supposed to be blonde. Yeah. It's yeah, I'll no, give you that. This is a very, very small point in an otherwise pretty horrific film. But um, the, the hair just... She'll cry. She's going to cry. It's fine. It Honestly, I am me. tough to this. No, but you are right, though. I mean, there's literally no reason why you couldn't make him blonde. Yeah. It's almost like they were like, oh, he's a rocker now. Must black have hair. black hair. It's yeah. like, no. Right. It's definitely, like, loosely based on the concept of the book and the series and the characters. Mm-hmm. But, loosely being the operative word well yeah I mean let's give it its due it's, it's yeah. not winning any Oscars anytime soon um, but I still love it and I'm not ashamed either speaking of great films how did we speak about Hugh Jackman and not mention Van Helsing look I, I love Van Helsing we I love, love Van Helsing the like best film. literally <laughs> unironically we vibe that film so hard best werewolf transformation like, of all time speaks to me I love it. I love mm-hmm. it so much. Right. I love Hugh Jackman in it. Mm-hmm. I love the whole like weird, you know, battle through the ages thing. Yes. I love Kate Beckinsale in it. Yes. Um, Again, though, though her you know, it's done so dirty, so dirty, so dirty, so, so dirty. mad about it. Yeah. They fridged her essentially. Yes. Um, yep. Fridged was... for man pain. Yeah. But... They did a lot of that in that era of cinema. Like, mm-hmm. here's your strong female she's now dead because the man is more important and his pain is more important and his because yeah. they were going to make a couple of films and it was meant to be like the spur on for his journey to figure out like more shit so but they never did so she just died for no weird reason yeah that's really weird and if he hadn't turned up there they she'd probably still be alive yeah but it's like oh the thing is, it's, huge she, she dies so st- stupidly yes. as well because like this she she literally bounced off several castle roofs mm-hmm. like you're dead now uh, yeah <laughs> yeah like she yeah. D- you know there was like a whole like physics defying yes element to all of her yeah friends. she literally at one point like it's <laughs> she's on top of that cage and she like backflips i know oh, she's on the floor and it hits her foot and she's like Pachoo, but i'm fine because i'm yeah the the girl in this action film um, it would have been better had Hugh Jackman like full on Mulder and then yeah. the little um, minister had just gone. Mm. Yep, but instead Monday. they had they had him yeah. jump her. Nothing happens to her. She no. dies gorgeous still. Yeah, there's no no um, no no wound, no nothing. So I just guess like... it's like the concept that he broke her spine something. I but again, she so just she's like stuff everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm kind of like. Yeah, maybe he just literally like snapped that one tiny rib that like punctured something, and then she was dead. Mm-hmm. 
Dundee. But she looks fabulous. So, you know, she like, does. No, no external damage, because that would not be becoming. She had that, no, like, no. game-changing hair, too, that does never stop being, like, twirly. Oh, uh, I want her hair. Mm. What a film. I want that what outfit. A film. What a film. But also, um, homoeroticism between Dracula and Van, and, um, Van Helsing. And the brides and um, Anna. Gabriel. Yeah. Oh, oh, Gabriel. Gabriel. <laughs> you have no idea how often Heather and I say that to each other. It's actually embarrassing. It's literally me and my partner. <laughs> just call, it's just the best thing. We had a D&D game going and someone was called Gabriel. And it was disruptive to every session because it had to be yeah. mentioned every time his name was mentioned. I actually forgot about that. <laughs> it's law, obviously. <laughs> Um, but it is true though. Like, I don't hmm. think you can have vampires without having homoeroticism. No, I don't. Like, no, don't work. I don't think so. There's a really interesting argument as well about why um, quite a lot of female vampires are lesbians. Yeah. Um, I read an interesting paper on that as well recently, so I can link please link that in the chat as well. Um, because that was really interesting, and that was again about uh, levels of aggression mm-hmm. and. Mm. A shitty view of lesbians from men. Mm-hmm. So I was like, mm-hmm, "This makes a lot of sense." It does, and it's getting like kind of like othering factor as mm-hmm. well. Um, weirdly enough, I read a I read a book called The Deathless Girls, which I had no idea was a retake on sort of Dracula until the the end. Oh. Um, <laughs> okay. And yeah, like literally halfway through the book, I was like, wait a minute, is this going where I think it's going? And then it, it actually did. And I was like, holy shit. Um, but yeah, like it, even in that book, right, they kind of do the, I'm not going to go too much into it because obviously people might want to read it, but um, they do the kind of story of the Bites of Dracula and two of them are sisters. And even in that book, they still have mm. a queer relationship and the vampires are still homoerotic mm. and it's it's just unless you're doing the kind of like nosferatu type of, of corpse yeah, monster, be still yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah then then it just it doesn't work yeah unless you're like you know twilight when everybody waits for marriage well, um yeah. and also knows. shush um there's also definitely a point where like they're so fancy and well groomed and rich. There's like a whole thing of like, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Indulgence and like this like hedonistic lifestyle. Mm-hmm. That I think that they like embody really well as well. Like it goes like picture of Dorian Gray almost. Yes. Yeah, that was literally what I was picturing. Like a sort of den of inequity kind of like you go there, you know. Also, like, the bar in True Blood, that's also what I'm, like, picturing. Like, you know, it's, like, not the best place you may die, but also you're going to have, like, a really good time. <laughs> the vibe I get from all vampires. Go on, Georgie, tell us about the um, no fun before marriage. I was actually going to say that Alice is very clearly a queer woman. But anyway. Oh, yeah, for um, sure. Speaking yeah. of the picture of Dorian Gray, which I think is really, really it's obviously an awesome comparison because unbiased is like my favorite book um you've got that concept of interiority and exteriority also, and the concept of played by stuart townsend in league of extraordinary gentlemen it's true mm-hmm. see it is true interconnectivity also the film was terrible but i, I do loved think... it <laughs> no one shocked are they like ben barnes even though he's got dark hair and dark eyes and Dorian is blonde hair blue eyes mm. I don't like blonde hair blue eyes so I like that he's got brown hair and brown eyes um I thought he was great anyway not the point interiority and exteriority um really really important I think with vampires because they do like we said before have that kind of veneer of not necessarily mm. respectability but it's exactly like you said the monsters are designed to lure you in mm-hmm. and then that kind of monster underneath it all it's um yeah, it's a yeah. Venus flytrap definitely was a good way to sum them yeah. up. Mm. Mm. I like that. Have you guys read um, the Southern Book Club's Guide to Vampires? Link? No, no, I it's really need to. Really good. Um, I actually I finished reading it like in January or something, um, and that has a really different idea of some aspects of like the myth, but like some of them. Um, 
like remain the same and it's really interesting to see it in such a mundane setting as like a little southern town it's a very good book and we have a review of said book going out super soon Love that's that. exciting Ooh. i will have have to check that out it's very good highly would highly recommend it um but back to interview um i thought the ending was legit because i love sympathy for the devil uh it's one of my favorite mm-hmm. rolling stones song but it is performed by guns and roses so it kind of sums up the whole film for me at the minute <laughs> which is kind of like it's good but it's not quite the right band um okay. but i would say axel rose in his heyday what a great start he would have been I mean, he definitely has the vanity for it. Yes. <laughs> the narcissism. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. That I just sort of feel like, obviously, heyday, not like when he Current. had braids and stuff. Um, but that would have been a really interesting choice. But I love that ending and the song choice and the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm-hmm. That wraps it up for me nice. Yeah, I think, I think part of it's like, especially because it's almost... You know, this obviously the last time we see him before the end of the film, he's all like decrepit mm-hmm. and you know hanging out in this ancient house in New Orleans and this really rank. squeaky chair, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and just like yeah. going to grind and like digging himself into a little hole and being going to sleep because mm-hmm. he's like he's like I don't want to deal with this. I'm going to bed for like 15 years or whatever. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that granted is exactly how I feel right now. Yeah, but, pandemic uh, <laughs> mood. Yeah, <laughs> but like the especially the bit you know he obviously goes out he feeds he regains his strength he goes to find louis louis mm-hmm. given this interview mm-hmm. which goes against vampire law which is not, mm-hmm. the, not the point but um he's there and he he apparently finds out that he's doing this maybe he's lo- looming outside the window or something in true mm-hmm. that fashion and oh, cool. um and louis like oh i'm not going to turn you david because haven't you been listening to me? Gets all very upset that he's mm-hmm. even been asked this question. David goes on his way, and Lestat's like, "Hey, <laughs> howdy!" <laughs> yeah, you were talking it's to my like boyfriend. He, yeah, it's like he does it just to like piss off Louis. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. And that's like another concept of like toxicity, control, isn't it? it? Yeah. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. I can't remember like how like, the Queen of the Damned actually starts like to follow on or is it before i get so confused it's it's after it's after okay, he's it's been after, asleep for... yes but it's not it's um before interview in this in the sense of before when louis speaking to the interviewer yes. but it's like after the sleep so yes. it's probably in and around the same sort of time yeah because he'd be like well fed because he's still kind of a bit monstery at the end of interview yeah. Mm. Mm. We have complaints about these 20 year old films. Can they be fixed, please? Um, oh my God, Queen of Damned is like nearly 20. Yeah. It's 2002, right? Um, yes, I want to say. Oh God. No, no, I would say older. I'm going to have to Google it right now. Um, please, oh, God, make me feel better about myself. <laughs> feel better about yourself. That would make me 12. <laughs> Well, interviews like twenty seven this yeah. year. So. Um, two thousand and two. Why is it? Definitely not the soundtrack for a twelve year old. I don't. Um, I, I need to. I go must have seen it a couple this. years later. I must have not seen that when that came out. My mum would not have let me listen to that kind of music. Um, well, I need to go and revisit the soundtrack now. I think. I'll I'll tell you guys when we're off air, like which oh, one okay. it is in particular, because I'm just not gonna say out because like no one needs to hear that when they're to this. The, so the small children listening to this podcast will be like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, okay, so um, I think this is going to be a tough question um, because uh, Dari, you said before that they are the ones in your mind now, but if you were going to remake Into oh, no. the Vampire. <laughs> I was going to ask within this. the last five years. So five I, I'm allowing years. for the for the Claudia to be de-aged a bit because obviously it may be an actress that you're aware of now who's a bit older. Within the last five years, who would you cast? Making a list, or you can go first. <laughs> uh, 
brushes twice, checking it twice. All of it's Robert Pattinson. I was I actually didn't know if I knew the names of enough actors. <laughs> uh... It's a tense moment here in the studio. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll edit this this dead air out, don't worry. <laughs> Just edit me kind of like staring into the abyss like... like he's like... I don't... I don't actually know if I know that many people. Um, okay. Even if you Claudia. can just think, like, someone, and we can try and figure out who they are, so you don't have to know their name. Who's a small child actor? I'm, I'm sorry. Well, that's I'm why, yeah, yeah, that's why I'll give well. you, like, a little yeah. leeway in terms of time. So I went for Dakota Fanning, but obviously age-appropriate, so, like, when she was younger. No. Actually, I, I think... feel like she has the chops to pull off that, like, manic rage of wanting yeah. to be a woman, but being trapped as a child. Saoirse Ronan. Nice. I think would be good. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about our boys? I think Timothy Chalamet is Louis, because he's pointy and skinny, and he can definitely look melancholy. Okay. Well, that's a baby choice. Uh, mm. For that, the guy... I don't know what his name is, right. his real name that is. But you know the guy that played um, Onyoras in Les Mis? The blonde guy. <laughs> Which one for? Lestat? Uh, yeah. I, don't know, I, I don't... can't think of anyone who's good enough to play Lestat. He's the only person who's in my head right now. Aaron Tavit? Tevit? Aaron Tevate! Aaron Tevate, I yes. love Aaron Tevate. He's the Broadway Absolutely. guy, right? Yeah. yeah I forgot that he yeah. was even in Lame. He was in he was in Rent, I think, as well. He was in Rent, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think he'd be I think he'd be a good list that. Hmm. And actually probably the guy that played uh Conter would be a decent Louis. But he's not he's not pointy enough. I think we should make it into a musical, is what you're saying to me right now? Yeah. I'm getting that vibe. It needs to be a musical. There'll be so many candelabras. <laughs> I'm so on board with this. I can't think of anybody who is like hot and arrogant enough to be a good convincing listener. Um, no. I went for Jonathan Reese Myers because he's a good Dracula. That's fair. Yeah. Okay. That's true. Um, and I went for a baby Hugh Dancy for for Lu- uh, for Louis. No. No. Oh, but no, he's so squishy and he's young. So beautiful. Or oh, Samuel Stewart Whitwe, who is. Super angular and pouty, but also beautiful. I can't think of, but, but don't think and he's got a bit of like a sudden draw. No, is is Louis? Oh, okay, then yeah. Oh, yeah, that happens in when he was mind. voted like most beautiful man and woman at uni because he's just the most beautiful. Ella Enchanted, what a film! Hmm. He's in that as well. I love that film. Yeah. Um, Mads Mickelson. Yes. That's Heather's any, fanfic version that she's written. Any I answer, think. any question that starts with that, I, the answer is yes. I, I put him as Armand. I think it's really interesting, like Armand. <laughs> yeah, he was my Armand choice because he has the sort of like he's been through shit and he knows shit and he's wise, like but he it's, still it's like stroke you down his face. Yeah. It's there of like danger oh, yes. versus knowledge that's, yes. mm. that's good. Mm. Although I can't picture him ginger. Well, well no, to be <laughs> fair, um, I think he has kind of gingery red hair in the film where he plays the one eyed Viking. This is really stretching my, my Matt Smuggleson knowledge. Uh, is he like a bit part? Is he like in it for no, like he's one in it. He's, it's a full. He is the main character all the way through. Um, he does not speak once. It is. Called... He doesn't speak. And he doesn't he's... speak at all. That's he has, so cool. He has like one eye. He has no shirt on. I think for most of it, it is Valhalla Rising. Okay. It's called okay. One Eye. Valhalla. I will have to watch that. It's called One Eye. I would like to see Diego Luna as Louis. Ah, that's an interesting choice. Mm. That's Again, that's like oh, yeah. my fanfic version, I think, maybe. Oh, he's I, such a sweet little face. I like face. that. That's mm-hmm. quite cute. 
I'm going through like my space Latinos who I love. Oscar Isaac can be anything. He can just be in it, like whatever he wants. <laughs> just honestly, just be I had thought about Tilda Swinton as Lestat. Is that because of what we do in the shadows? <laughs> no, because she's in that, isn't she? As a vampire. Uh, she's in Only Love is Left Alive. She is, yeah. In the TV I, series, isn't she? Oh, I've not watched the TV series I because I hate Matt Berry. No, about Tilda Swinton because mm. I don't. She's certainly like, you know, phenomenal actor and stuff, but. Mm. I don't feel like I've she seen her. she carry vanity and. Well, this that is kind it. Of... I don't know if I've yeah. seen her do enough, like. Um, of like the the narcissism vanity <laughs> side. Charlize Theron. Also, yes, is the answer to whatever that question. Like, is. do Snow White and the Huntsman meets Atomic Blonde? Charlize Theron. Yep. Love that. Yep. 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 Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what we're saying is we're going to have an interview with Vampire Remake with yes. all women and also yes. musical. Yes. Um. Yes. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Well, we're gonna have to change things up now. Who's gonna be Lady Louie? Lady Louie. Kit McGrath. Ooh, Ooh. Good choice. Nice. Easier are we, to think are we, of women. <laughs> yeah. Literally. Why is that immediately what's happening right now? Um. That's a good choice, actually. Mm. Anna de Armas. Mm-hmm. I think she's beautiful. She is you know beautiful. Also, be really good, like Lestat, uh, Eva Green. Yes, Eva Green. Yes, Rachel Weisz. Rachel Weisz. Rachel Weisz well. could do a mond. Yes, to oh Eva gosh. Green's Lestat. Like, I think that'd be a really interesting, like, dynamic. Oh my god! <laughs> it's this. happening. We're gonna make it. It's gonna be very low budget, but we'll do it. Can we crowdfund? But because, it? <laughs> yeah, we'll crowdfund yeah. this. <laughs> To get Eva Green, Rachel Weisz, it happen. And Charlie Theron. Yeah, I would watch that. Oh no, wait. No, I've got my people mixed. Charlie Theron is Lestat. Oh yeah. Eva Green and... is Louis, right? And then Rachel Weisz is Armand. Is that what we're saying? Yeah. Who's going to be Claudia? No one cares. Some boy. Right. <laughs> Are we having a little boy now? No, I'm still dying this. for Sir Sharona. Yeah. To be yeah. Honest. Yeah. We'll have to de aging her might be tricky. (laughs) (laughs) I think, like, if Florence Pugh were younger, she could be a good Claudia. She's good at the whole, like, unhinged emotion thing, I think. Mm. I haven't seen her do anything as a child. No. No. Hmm. Well, interview the vampire. Um, we're going to make we the made best a better version in five minutes, so. like you've ever seen. Um, mm-hmm. So we're going to wrap it up with our little <laughs> comments from our community before we just spiral and we end up writing the songs for you here and now. Um, so our friends over at Nerds Chatting said that they straight up love this film. Its production values. It's creepy. How it deals with immortals realizing their fate while they're doomed to walk the earth as monsters. A superb gothic horror. And Poetic. Really well. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we did promise, and of course we will deliver, Georgie's mum. Little mom has asked, Broad. Yeah. Queen herself yeah. has asked me to say that she loves this film and it's one of her favourites and that everyone's really beautiful in it. Love it. And it's we literally love... like hearing me talk. <laughs> and we love her. So Georgie's mum. Yeah, gotta go I on. had that song so yeah. much at college at me about my mom. Yeah. She's so fancy. <laughs> like, you can't That's not lovely. love her. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay. We're going to wrap it up here. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, where can the people at home catch up with what you're up to? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Dara Loller and you can find me on Twitter at Dara underscore Loller. Thank you. We will we'll put post, it all in there. Yeah, we'll post the links in the little um, boxy thing that one day I will learn the name of. Whatever it I is. Think it's the just description. description. Yeah, the yeah. box thing where the writing is. Um, yeah. So be good. Stay safe. Um, beware the beautiful people that kind of shimmer a little bit. Yeah. Or not. Or not. Yeah, we're not judging. You know, go for your life. <laughs> Whatever you fancy. It's fine. <laughs> uh, and we'll see you again next time. Bye for now. Bye.